let's go ahead and get started. I don't know about you guys, but uh, well, I think when I tell you who this is, I think you're going to be pretty excited because, uh, well, I like these guys a lot. So uh, we're going to bring out a duo from Google. We're going to bring up uh, Shamol, who is a technical program manager, and also Mike Albano, who is a wireless network engineer at Google. Uh, whenever I say Mike's name, I have to like really consciously think like, okay, Mike Albano, not clients dot Mike Albano, right? Anybody else run into that? So anyway, let's welcome up to the stage both Shamol and Mike. Come on out. Uh, Mike Albano. So real quick background for those that don't know me. Um, I got my start in higher ed, route switch guy, um, back in the early 2000s. Then wireless came around and I took interest in it. Um, went, spent some time at a, in an MSP environment. And now I'm over doing uh, the enterprise side of the house for Google. So basically working on uh, deploying, monitoring, all that stuff of Google's enterprise Wi-Fi. Uh, thanks, hi, I'm Shimol. I work with Mike. Um, I'm a TPM, so I help run wireless network engineering programs. Uh, I work with Mike. Uh, we have a small team. Uh, we primarily look after the enterprise network, uh, which includes all the data centers, um, the companies which Google goes and buys, and so on. Um, we wanted to talk today about how we run our enterprise Wi-Fi network. Uh, we use APIs. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about what open APIs um, adventure, which we have been working on for the last 18 months, where we are. And uh, we'll end the, the talk with a small demo about how we are running a multi-vendor network using one uniform API to build as well as operate the network. With that, Mike, do you want to kick it off? Sure. All right, so anybody ever heard of open config? Show of hands? Yeah, a few people. Not too many of you, maybe five, 10%. Um, all right, so I'll start off with what it, what it is. Um, so you know, the one-liner is vendor neutral data models for interacting with network elements authored by network engineers. So I think the last part is probably the most important one to highlight. This is what sort of differentiates open config from maybe other standards bodies things. Um, authored by network engineers, so that's us, everybody in this room, right? Um, me, you, we're the ones that sort of get together every week and decide what we want that common API, that schema to look like. Um, so that's, that's pretty important to highlight. Um, it's informal. It's, uh, like I said, we just sort of get together every week. There's no lawyers involved, there's no copyrights. Um, it's not owned by any one company. It's open. Um, if you want to see it, there's, you know, there's the link. It's on GitHub. That's where we publish um, the data models. Um, so to draw some analogies around, you know, to get a little bit more specific, if, you know, open config is the schema, GNMI is the transport, GNOI is what's left. So what do I mean by that? Um, so analogies to older technologies, Open config and, and Yang data models would be sort of analogous to an SNMP MIB for those that are used to working with those. Uh, GNMI, uh, which is a proto that defines how to use gRPC as the transport, that would be, you know, what's another form of transport? SSH. That's something that everybody's probably familiar with. Um, and GNOI is for operational commands, which is basically a way to send RPCs at a network element to say, hey, ping this device or upgrade firmware or, you know, reboot an AP. Um, so that hopefully is a general introduction to, you know, what, what it is. Um, and then here's, I just pasted this in from the, the website. Here's like, so who cares about it? Who's, you know, involved in um, pushing vendors to support this? Who, who wants, this, wants to see this thing land? Um, you can go to the, the website and see the list of participants. Um, this slide is, it's not really about, you know, the, the purpose of this slide isn't really to name drop, oh, look at the big company names on there. It's actually more important to highlight who's not on this slide, and that's vendors, right? You don't see 
Cisco, or Arista, or Mist, or HP. There's no vendors on this slide. That's because vendors don't participate. Vendors are on the other side. So network engineers, us, we're the ones defining the schema. We're the ones telling the vendors what thing, how it should look like. What is that common format? And then the vendors you know, go off and implement it. So this flips the paradigm a little bit. Right? This is no longer us saying, we want this feature. Please, vendor X, go develop it. This is us defining the model, putting it on GitHub, and saying to the vendors, you either support open configure or you don't. And if you do, that's exactly, you know, go see GitHub for what your, inner, you know, what your API should look like. So why did we do it? Um, well, when I first started, you know, looking at the enterprise and, and you know, joining the, the, the enterprise group at Google, I did a lot of the standard stuff like, you know, write designs, come up with how we should do our surveys and how we should, where we should place APs and the channel planning and the channel ways, all, all of that sort of standard stuff, right? Um, but then it got to a point where it's like, okay, that's kind of a self-driving train now or, you know, we've got our processes defined and that's kind of driving itself. We've got folks that do each part of that sort of build process. But how, how do I go to the next level or how can I add value to, to the enterprise? What, what can I do to make it better, right? To better, faster, stronger automation, you know, monitor it better. And that's really what drove, you know, drove us to start looking at this open config thing or more specifically the management plane. Like that operating the network is actually where we're spending the remainder of our time once we fix the deploy problem. So we realized we needed telemetry, which is radio data, and we needed it fast. Uh, by fast, I mean not by SNMP. Um, so another thing we tried, when I say this next one is, you know, we wanted to move away from translation layers. What is a translation layer? Well, we thought, okay, so some vendors have APIs, uh, REST APIs, NetConf APIs. Um, some vendors are already doing APIs into their system. So we said, well, why don't we just sort of build our tool set so that at the very last moment before sending the config or before doing a get for that telemetry, we'll just translate to that vendor-specific API. And then we can deploy multi-vendor networks and we can build a common tool chain um, and we'll still be able to work with you know, all the different APIs. So we tried, that's what we're, I'm referring to translation layers, is translating right at, you know, right at the end there. Um, it kind of worked for a short period of time and then it really fell hard. Um, basically, we were susceptible to the same problems of the past. Um, if you're familiar with working with even CLIs or SNMP, the MIBs change, versions change, um, the whole thing topples over. So the reason why that's more important in the you know, API world than it was before is because when an interface changed before, like there was a human interacting with that CLI and, oh, that command doesn't work anymore, let me try a different one or type question mark. Well, that's not happening when you have machines configuring machines. When, you know, when it's automated, the automation has a way of failing in a fantastic way where everything breaks. So the translation layers were, were dangerous. So that's, another reason, that's a, you know, another reason why we wanted a standard uh, schema, a standard API. And, you know, the third one's kind of obvious. We needed programma programmatic access to everything. So the only way we'll interact with a network element, an AP or a controller, is through the API. Uh, no more CLI screen scraping or anything like that. All right. So how does it solve those three problems? Telemetry, mm -hmm. uh, streaming telemetry, buzzword if anybody's heard of it. Um, it's a big part of open config. So open config, even though it has config in the name, telemetry is, is just as much, if not more important than, than a configuration, right? The, the ability to monitor it um, in, a, in a better way, and by better I mean faster, more efficient. Um, if you pick up a, any vendor's documentation, it's somewhere between 15, and a half, 15 minutes and a half hour before you should wait between polling controllers. Um, like that doesn't work, right? When you roll up data, it kind of becomes useless. Something like channel utilization is useless even, even in a minute increment. Um, so how does it fix the translation layer problem? Well, that hopefully is obvious. It's one schema, one API, one standard format for all the vendors that we work with. Um, and since it's an API, it's programmatic access. Um, that's hopefully self-evident. Um, all right, so here's the 
the evolution of, you know, sort of what we went through over the years, trying to get to where we are now. Um, you know, a couple years ago, it was still mostly expect scripts and SSHing to stuff, and it was trying to figure out a way to get, you know, one show command to look like another show command or how to interpret the output of that show command and turn that what's called unstructured data into structured data, things like text FSM and stuff like that, if you've ever heard of it. Um, then we moved on to APIs, the proprietary kind, the one where each vendor's API looked different, and we tried to do it that way. Um, and now, you know, starting in 2019 and beyond, it's all, all standard, all open config, model-based um, telemetry. So, what did it look like before? Um, we had a lot of controllers, so this is a this is a highly distributed enterprise. We have a lot of buildings, a lot of sites globally, um, and that meant a lot of controllers, like a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of things to manage, a lot of things to uh, configure and, and rotate. Um, you know, when they get aged out. Uh, so there was a lot of centralized data plane. Um, there's a fairly significant failure domains when you centralize that data plane. Um, we didn't really like that. Um, and configuration management was, it was kind of hard because it basically meant, you know, screen scraping at best and at worst having engineers log into stuff and we had our golden templates of, you know, make sure the running configuration looks like this doc of 800 lines. <laughs> so, yeah, it was highly, highly manual. Um, and the telemetry problem was we didn't really have radio data fast enough to take action on it. Like, it was delayed by minutes, and by that time the problem has happened and gone away, or the user has been, you know, angry enough to move on. Um, so, that's how it was before. This is how it is now. Controllers only where required. I mean, you know, the whole centralized versus distributed data plane thing is sort of out of scope of open config. Use them if you, you know, use a centralized data plane if you want. It doesn't really matter. This is how we have approached the problem. Um, we only use controllers where we need to. Um, configuration management is, is, I'll get a bit, this will clear up a little bit when I do the demo of how we do configuration management, but it's, it's a bit less of a problem when you have machines configuring the machines instead of humans because it kind of makes it a lot harder to, for config drift to occur. Um, and Shamal will talk specifically about mm -hmm. you know, how, how, we, how we do that. Um, so no humans for config pushing or monitoring. No show commands. Those are, we don't use show commands anymore. We don't log into devices anymore to get, um, to get the telemetry. And it's, it's granular. It's, uh, it's, uh, Streaming telemetry is a pub sub model. It's not us polling saying, hey, what's your channel utilization now? Hey, what's your channel utilization now? Or retries or any of that. Pub sub changes that paradigm to where we just subscribe to a stream, we open that channel once, and it just constantly pushes us that radio data. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Shamal to talk about, more specifically about how we use it. Cool. Here, you want this? All right, thank you, Mike. So, um, in the next couple of slides, I'll try to walk you through how did we take open config, how did we integrate it in our build process, uh, what were some of the tools which we used in the process, and how does our deployment pipeline look like. Um, I'll talk about revision control, how, what are the aspects in the build process which still need human beings to look at it, right? And what are the things which are automated to their entirety? I'll talk about some of the checks and balances in the system to make sure that the automation is doing the right thing. And finally, we'll look at what's our operations pipeline. How do we get all this rich radio data in a frequent manner? What do we use to do proactive fault detection and isolation? And um, once that's done, Mike's going to try to show you some of what we have in our network. Um, some of the vendors which we use with open config, what is the radio data we get with it, and so on. So, um, so as we started on this, um, some of these principles we defined for ourselves and we agreed upon, and we used that as source of truth just to, as guardrails, to make sure that as we started in this journey, we, we tried to abide by it 
as we went along, right? Um, so the first and most important thing was try to move human beings away from the process as much as possible. Human beings are good, but they make a lot of mistakes. Um, the, a human being is susceptible to error by design. Um, so if you have, as Mike put it, machines configuring machines, there is less chance of error if your automation was designed in the right way and there are ongoing fail-safe and guardrails in the system. Um, the only thing which we wanted human beings to do is build a heat map, define where to place access points, try to give some supporting data on the heat map, what is going to be the name of the access point, what channel, what's going to be the transmit power, and a couple of other KPIs. Beyond that, that is the only thing which a human being is doing. Of course, they'll go mount the AP. But beyond that, from a network engineering side, that's the only thing which a network engineer is going to do. Um, we wanted to make the deployment process very simple for a network engineer, right? Earlier, we used to have um, the very uh, traditional approach, buy controllers, pre-stage them in a build room, configure them, send them on site, bring them up, provision APs, make sure everything works, and uh, that used to take weeks or days, depending upon what was the complexity. So we wanted to move all that away and try to shrink that time to the extent possible, right? So we wanted to go from weeks and days to maybe minutes or less than that, if we could. Um, as we grew as a company, it's imperative for us that we don't grow our network engineering staff, right? We need to be able to do more with less. Um, whenever a network admin needed to make changes, right, they shouldn't have to run anything or log into a device, right? They should be able to use the same heat map to make design changes, and the subsequent downstream system should handle the config change, pushing it, assurance that the config push was succeeded, that it matches what we intended, and there is no drift, right? Since we want to have a multi-vendor network, right, usually multi-vendor is interpreted as we have to learn how each vendor does it, right? And that adds a lot of toil and overhead for our operation staff. So if we were to build a multi-vendor network, we wanted to make sure that it doesn't add any additional burden for our operation staff. So what we decided is we will build it in such a way that they should essentially be able to run the network through a dashboard. So if we don't expose every single thing which they need to do their job in a dashboard, then we did it wrong. And the dashboard should look exactly the same, irrespective of what vendor is being used. So with that, um, I'll show you this thing, right? So this is our current build process. Um, we start at the bottom left, um, the heat map, right? We use Google Slides, because just because that was something which did the job. Um, we place, uh, Mike's going to show you an actual heat map how it looks like, what are some of the parameters we put in it. Um, so we build the heat map, we place access points, we, we put all the parameters needed on what we want the site to look like from a Wi-Fi design point of view. Um, it all goes into um, a single tool uh, which we wrote as a team. Uh, it's called Wi-Fi front-end, Python-based. We have a small team, about five network engineers, um, Nobody has any background in programming or anything. Everybody kind of self-learned Python in the last 18 months and put this thing together, right? It's, it works. <laughs> it's not pretty, but it, is, it works uh, fairly well. Um, that tool generates a vendor-neutral open config JSON file, right? In the back end, it does go and interact with our IP address management system, DHCP, DNS, and so on. Right. Um, we have an Android app which we developed for our low voltage contractors, LVCs, saying when you go, when you go install a MAC address, right? Earlier they would write down the name of the AP and the MAC address, give it to us. The network engineer would go to the CLI, provision each AP. Right? What we did here is we gave them a small, simple Android app. It scans the name of the AP, access point. It goes and puts it in a database. 
We used a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet, because it gave us API access as a database. That is, in turn, also read by Wi-Fi front-end to generate the subsequent downstream AP provisioning commands. Once all of that is done, a vendor agnostic JSON file is created, stored in some kind of a revision control system, GitHub, um, or any other version is supported. Um, and finally, the system goes and pushes it to the end network device, right? And um, GNMI is the protocol used to actually push. It's basically gRPC-based network management interface. It's just a simple standard way of interacting with the network element. Um, the device gets the configuration um, through GNMI. It configures itself, right? And then subsequently, it um, we, we have not put it here, but then we have the last and only thing, which is manual, is, is we have somebody go on site to do a post-install site survey, just to make sure that from an RF point of view, things were done the way we intended it to happen. And that's just because every office we have is very different. Um, then it's not like a cookie cutter setup. Our facilities team gets creative and tries to make it look nice, but that adds a lot of barriers. But the heat map is done by very templatized, um, low-skilled engineers. They are not like actual network engineers in our team, right? They are just folks who are trained just to churn out heat maps. And the post-install site survey are done by similar, like, low-skilled labor. It's not network engineering time being worked. Right? So that's, that's how we deploy it. Earlier, this, this process used to take us up to two weeks, right? From anything from 60 to 80 hours of actual time, uh, which an engineer would spend. Now this takes us less than 15 minutes. And the reason it's 15 minutes is there is always something which we want to make sure, because this is something which we have been deploying now with for about 10 months. So we are still adding fine tuning, and we are learning and making it better, right? The goal is to go down to less than five minutes for this whole process. So the way it works today is an AP shows up, unconfigured, gets unboxed, put in the ceiling, gets scanned. The automation tool, the heat map is pre created before the AP show up on site. The automation tool is run, which generates the configuration, pushes it, tells the person who ran it, saying, configured, matches what you intended, do, does all the post-installation verification from a configuration point of view and says, seems to be configured and working, and then sends a signal to somebody to go on site to do the post-install verification to make sure that the signal is accurate. From an operation side, um, we are collecting a lot of radio data. We are collecting it very frequently. Uh, for some things, it's 30 seconds. For certain other things, it is 15 seconds or five seconds. Um, with streaming telemetry, we have pivoted to a model that let's not go and do periodic gets from the network device. Let the network device tell us whenever there is a change. And that is, uh, that is something which we are collecting at a very aggressive frequency. So what happens with all this information which we collect? One, um, it goes into a dashboard. And Mike's going to show you that dashboard. It exposes all the all the parameters for our frontline operation staff. So when they get a trouble ticket and they just want to know, hey, how is Wi-Fi at the site? Is the AP up? Is it on the right channel? How do, how many clients? What's the association history? Has this client roamed? Uh, is there interference? How is the noise floor? Everything, right? So all that's in a dashboard. Um, in addition to that, we also have a lot of proactive alerting. So we watch for conditions in the same database and say, hey, if this is happening, I need to go tell somebody so that a frontline staff does not wait for a trouble ticket to come in. Right? And the thing which is work in progress is the one on the top. Right? We are actually trying to do some um, data munging with all the data we are collecting to do a lot of event correlation to figure out that, hey, if this certain set of conditions occur, very good chance that there is a problem. Maybe let's generate something for 
the frontline staff to at least start looking at it. Um, streaming telemetry is something which is very new, right? We have, been, we have started playing with it for the last uh, three or four months. Uh, right now, most of our telemetry is collected outside of streaming. It's still 15-second intervals with, without streaming, but with streaming, we are going down to like one second or three seconds for every single parameter which we are collecting. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to give it back to Mike. So uh, you can maybe show them a quick demo. Yeah, I will uh, give this a shot on the hotel network. Um, I have about a 50% chance of working. Um, all right, so the first thing I'm going to show you is, uh, like Shamal alluded to, I wrote this Python script that basically goes out, looks at that heat map the over the drive API. There it goes, spits out uh, uh, open config formatted JSON. So you want to show the heat map? If yeah. You have that so handy. basically, this is is what we are calling a heat map. So you know, Wi-Fi people, you know what a heat map is. It's basically a way to enumerate dots on a floor plan and phi layer, right? So very common for us to enumerate. What do we want our phi layer config to be on a heat map? That's channel, transit power, channel width, and frequency. Um, so that's what we have been calling a heat map. Um, and this is an example. The only reason we use slides is because there's a nice REST API to it. I mean, we just needed something, anything, that would let us put a picture on it with dots. Um, so you can use, you know, whatever you want. Like a lot of what I'm showing you here is, you know, technically out of scope of OpenConfig. This is more about how we're using it. Um, so this is what we refer to as a heat map. Um, that, that's a single AP on there um, with some phi layer information. And uh, when we run the tool, it spits out this open config formatted JSON. Um, not really keen on going over all that, but. I mean, this is just for the sake of the demonstration that we are showing the JSON file. For the actual person doing the deployment, they just hit a button in a, in a GUI. And so the yeah. thing happens in the background and pushes the configuration. All they see is a green checkbox saying pushed, configured as intended, seems to be operating as intended. So. What I just did was I ran it in configure mode. It updated the, the network element, um, spit out a thing that said, yep, update, OK. And right before it actually configured the AP, it wrote the, that, that same JSON file to GitHub. So this would be like your revision control to track changes. When did they happen? Um, you know, when were they initiated? So the, what you're seeing here, let me just refresh, is the same thing that was on the screen before, just the open config formatted JSON. And we can do things like, uh, let's look at the history, updated, committed one minute ago. And, you know, there's our diff, changed from 44 to 48. So, you know, this is, the operator can do this in whichever way they want. Um, this is just how we chose to do it. Um, so, you know, we have our oh, any, raise, show of hands. Anybody ever heard of uh, Grafana as a visualization tool? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of open source tools now that sort of help. You know, if you want to roll your own, so to speak, um, you know, do your own thing. Um, the Influx DB stack. Like, there's just a lot out there for for any of the older folks. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to roll your own before, but like, this is what graphs used to look like. <laughs> Nagios, anybody ever used Nagios before? Yeah, long time Nagios user. Uh, so, you know, open source has come a long way. This, this sucks compared to what it looks like now. Um, but this is our internal tool. So, okay, so we, we configure the network elements, um, and now we're monitoring them in the same way, that same schema, right? That it's all sort of formatted to this, this, this same one uniform model. So what do we do with that telemetry? Well, we graph it. Uh, just like, this is just like any other NMS you've ever looked at. So you've got your, you know, your channel utilization, uh, transmit, receive, uh, noise floor, stuff like that, right? So this shouldn't be any, nothing really groundbreaking here. This is just our internal visualization tool. Um, you could use Grafana or anything else. Um, or you could use none of it, right? Like you can use OpenConfig just to configure stuff. Let's say, you know, it just depends on where you are as an organization. Do you want to just configure stuff in, the, in a uniform way, but you want to look to a vendor to give you that NMS to visualize it, because you don't want to sort of deal with that, 
you know, that's fine too. Or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe you want to monitor stuff using open source tools, but you don't want to deal with the, all of the, you know, writing your own tool to configure it or using some other open source tool to configure it. You know, it's sort of up to you. Um, so as an example, like if I click clients, I think Keith brought this up before. It's like, well, you know, how are you using this stuff? Um, TX rate, well, okay, so this is a demo or a, a uh, this AP is in a building that we used to play with, so there's no clients connected to it right now, but he was saying before, like, MCS rates, transmit rates, receive rates, yeah, we, we graph that for every client, and we're getting that constantly, and we can change our retention rules as we see fit, and we can do things like, hey, when the average MCS is zero or one for, like, greater than 80% of the clients over a certain amount of time, like, maybe you should take a closer look at that. Um, so it's, you know, having the control to do the, that data retention as we see fit. Like, we can say, store this for years if we want. Um, and we can start to look at trends. Um, so that, you know, that, that's how we use it. Um, if I flip over to this tab, you'll see this is a different vendor. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you can even, see, it's kind of an eye, eye chart. Let me just zoom in. Um, so we put in this little vendor uh, column here. You might, you might be wondering, like, okay, so it's multi-vendor. Visualizations look exactly the same. Our operations staff, the, the frontline people that are looking at this stuff, when they look at the you know channelization and the, you know the a user report comes in and they want to try and figure out what's going on, they don't even know what vendor is deployed at the site. They don't have to because we're graphing it in the exact same way. We're monitoring the network in the exact same way regardless of vendor. So why do we have a little thing there that says, hey, which vendor is this? Well, as it turns out, when the APs fail it's a good idea to send the failed APs back to the right vendor. So when MIST gets an Arista AP back, they don't know what to do with it. So we did have to, you know, at the end of the day, at some point you do need to know which vendor is, is you know, deploys, is hanging off the ceiling. Um, so that's basically how we're using it. Um, is there anything else I wanted to highlight from here? We um. could... We could go straight to questions. Um, yeah, let's, let's do questions. Okay. You want to open it up for questions? I know I could probably answer some questions proactively, but let's see if they come up on screen first. There you go. All right. Do you, you guys want me to facilitate it all, or you guys got I it? I can go for it. Cool. All right, where do you see open config versus WFA data element certification? Um, so the WFA has a data element certification. I think I know what this is referring to. There's this notion in the WFA about a Yang model that should be used as some, uh, I think it's representative of some form of telemetry standardization, like trying to get vendors to provide a, a standard telemetry thing. Um, or at least get, get it to look the same. Um, so I could see where there's some overlap there, but OpenConfig has no ties to any certification committee or, um, you know, there's no IEEE involvement, there's no vendor involvement. OpenConfig is authored and driven by us, network engineers. We actually don't want standards bodies. We don't want to be slowed down. That, there's... You know, that's been tried many times in the past. That we're purposefully trying to shift the paradigm here to just say, this is what we want, vendors. It's on GitHub. If you play nicely, I'll welcome you on the network. That's, that's why I call it a, a paradigm shift. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a vendor, you do what the customer asks. I know it doesn't seem that way, <laughs> but, you know, vendors receive feature requests. They stack rank it against all the other million feature requests they have, and then they deliver the one they think will, you know, help them ship the most APs, or something like that. Um, so this is really, like, one of, the, one of the reasons I'm here, the message I'm trying to send is if you think this is cool or, you, you know, you want to approach having this standard uniform way of configuring and monitoring your, your APs, then do nothing more than ask your vendor to support it. Uh, you know, you can, that's the easiest way to, to, to support this, or you can get involved. It's, it's open. Any one of you can join the group. There's the openconfig.net, like I showed before, you can join the discussion. We meet every week. Um, you know, there's plenty of ways to get involved. It doesn't cost anything. There's no entrance fee. It's not owned by Google. It's, it's open. 
Um, so yeah, we, we are not really working with standards bodies. We're, that's not the approach we're taking. Um, we'd rather move faster than that. Um, all right, let's go to the next, the next one. one. How do you get the AP to publish its telemetry? Okay, so good question. So the whole notion, you know, I glossed over it, we don't have a lot of time, but the whole notion of what, you know, what is PubSub, what we refer to as PubSub. It's a publisher subscriber mechanism. So basically, I, one time I subscribe to the, um, to the AP and I say, here's the telemetry I'm interested in. That, that gRPC channel, that TCP channel stays open, right? So the AP then sends me, there's a couple different ways to do it. I'll try to go fast, but basically, It'll send me either, it'll be an on-change notification, so like if you subscribe to a, a leaf that says, tell me when the AP is disconnected, right? It'll, it'll only send me an update when that a, the state of that AP actually goes to disconnected. The channel will remain open, but it only sends me an update when, it, when, the, when the state of the thing changes. Another, the sort of opposite example is something like channel utilization. You're not gonna say, hey, update me when channel utilization changes, because that's changing, you know, a thousand times a second. Um, you'll say, send me an, uh, an uh, five, basically a five, like you could do an increment, like five seconds. Every five seconds, send me what your current channel utilization is. And then the channel remains open, but every five seconds, it'll stream the results to you. And why that's so important is because when you think of the overhead induced by something like SNMP or any, even a REST API, you're constantly polling, right? You're authenticating to the thing, you're rebuilding that channel. Yes, it's okay. Uh, now send, now finally give me the payload, right? That comes with a lot of overhead. So PubSub or publisher subscriber mechanisms reduce all of that. You're just sort of opening that channel once and then remain, that channel remains open. So I hope that answers the question. I can take the next one. So what AP manufacturers support open config? Um, so as of now, Arista slash Mojo and uh, Mist slash Juniper support it. Uh, we use them in production. Cisco is working towards supporting it on their EWLC, um, the 9800 platform. Um, we are hoping to, we, we were at Cisco Live a few months ago and we, uh, Cisco did a talk on open config. They are hoping to get to a certain point so we can deploy them very soon, end of this year, mm -hmm. in our network. Absolutely. And um, Aruba is working to support it on their Aruba Cloud platform as well. And that should be also by, um, maybe end of this year or very early next year. Um, we, we, are, we have all four of these in our lab, right? Two of those are in production. We are trying to get the other two also into production as quickly as we can. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to touch like another message that I'm trying to send um, you know, to, to vendors or you know, why would vendors support this? Um, as it turns out, you may think that vendors like vendor lock-in. We thought so too, then we were nervous of, about this approach, but it turns out that vendors don't really like vendor lock-in. Well, one vendor does, and that's the vendor you're currently using. Every other vendor hates vendor lock-in because they can't get onto your network. So vendors would approach us saying, we've got this fancy new thing. It's like, okay, cool, give me some demo equipment, and then come back to me in a year after I retrain all of my ops and rewrite all of my you know, deployment techniques to utilize your interface like that. It was just, it became unbearable. We couldn't run a multi-vendor network that way. So something like this is actually attractive to vendors because it, it lets them get onboarded. It makes the sales guy's job a lot easier. Um, all right, where could someone interested in learning open config start? Uh, what software do we need to learn? So there's a couple different ways you could start. Um, you can just start by you know, looking at, at GitHub, looking at the, the data models, you could start, you can read the website, you can join the group, you can, um, you know, come to the meetings, you can ping me, you can email me. I actually have a, a five hour deep dive that I sometimes give where, you know, I'll actually go into the nuts and bolts of how all this stuff fits together. It's on GitHub, it's a self-paced lab, you can do it yourself. Um, I, I'll, maybe I'll tweet out the, the link to the, to the GitHub URL um, after this, but, like you can do it in a self-paced fashion. It's a big long doc and it goes into all of the sort of nitty gritty of, of how all the, the components to open config and how you would actually use it in, you know, in the real world. Um, and then something about software, Python, yeah, go 
start learning Python. I don't have a software development background. I don't have a computer science degree. I'm just a network engineer, um, just like most of you. And this goes to the sort of shift towards DevOps that you've been hearing everybody sort of reference. You know, yeah, it's happening. It's happening a lot slower than I thought it would. If you would have asked me this question five years ago, I'd be like, yeah, every, every network engineer is going to have to be you know, coding. I mean, I started just like everybody else, small scripts, you know, to solve very small problems and, and went from there. And I still don't, I'm still not a, a you know, quote unquote DevOps guy. I can just write some Python and that, that's about it. Um, all right, what else we got? Static channels. Why do we do static? Why do you recommend static channel plan designed by humans? Did we say that? Did we say we recommend a static channel plan? Um, or has somebody just heard me rail on that <laughs> outside of this conference? Yeah. No, we didn't say that. We but. didn't say it, but we do do static channel plans. It's not, you know, like if you were to look at the open config schema, you'll see there's, there's config leaves for DCA or, or dynamic transfer power and setting the range and all that. Um, go ahead and use, use that stuff if you want. We don't use it uh, mostly because we found that static channel plans work better everywhere all the time. Did I say everywhere? All the time. And I'd have I mean, we wanted full predictable control of the network, and we have the rules in place in telemetry to tell us if it's not working the way we want. Yeah, I mean, the short of it is this. If you have a dynamic channel plan and an interferer shows up and you avoid that channel like the plague, what you've done is you've played a shell game and you've shifted the problem out to the other side of the floor where you actually have excessive CCI now. And now it's your problem. And a lot of the algorithms are just not that smart. I know that people would like to say they are, but they're not. And um, avoiding a channel isn't always the right move. More, more often than not, it's not the right move. We actually want the problem to stay so I can find it and remove it. Um, it's, just more, it's just about predictability. So that's why we use them. I, I can really talk to great extents about channel planning with anybody. I'm happy to do so after I walk off the stage. It's one of my favorite topics, channel width, channel planning, good stuff. All right, um, are you talking with trusted wireless environment? What's that? I guess, is it, does it mean, are we, is this oh, in the corporate network? That was, uh, that was a couple sessions ago, oh. yeah. Oh, okay, so maybe we can do the next one. Yeah, I don't know, I guess, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't talked to them. Yeah, if you guys are like me, it's like you're in and out, conversations, things happening. So, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get you guys in touch with okay. them. Um, someone else, we're not, uh, just real quick. Well, we have four minutes, so let me just, it's a decent segue. Another message I have to send, well, all about messages today, to software developers, like the, the people that are writing software and tools to help us. Um, so for the seven signals and the Nianzas of the world, um, like, you guys are showing us one viewpoint, right? So you have our controllers and our APs and our radio data that shows us one viewpoint. We've all been complaining about this for years. It doesn't show us the client's point of view. So then you have other folks coming along to help us with that, so, like we saw with 7Signal, showing us the client's viewpoint. Great, now we have that viewpoint. Trying to smash those two things together is difficult. Um, you know, the companies can try to do that, uh, and they've been trying to do that. They can. They can do those translation layers. They can get the SNMP MIBs and try and get, you know, talk to the Cisco controller and try and talk to the Aruba controller and try and access the MIST REST API and then try to give you that sort of holistic one view. But for those folks, my message is, wouldn't it be nice if there was a standard way you could get telemetry regardless of what vendor the operator has deployed? Now someone like 7Signal can come along and give us that client and AP point of view, right, in a much easier fashion. It makes their life easier. So this is, this is about, like, opening this up means basically fostering innovation, right? It makes it a tenable problem because now you give them a set of credentials and they can get radio data regardless of which vendor you've deployed. So it, it's kind of a, a rising tide situation. Um, all right, let's get through One the questions. One last question. What is the motivation to do multiple vendors? Why not pick the best one? So we tried that, right? Um, but um, I think as a business rule, we want to have the freedom of choice, right? We don't want to be locked in with one. Over time, being locked in with one leads to stagnancy, slowdown in innovation, stack ranked against all possible open feature requests. We've got uh, factory floors, we've got data centers, we've got offices, we've got people building Wi-Fi things. We've got basically 
we've got medical, we've got basically every vertical. This, there's not one vendor, there's not one piece of hardware that is best for all situations. You've heard people pe preach about this before, like, how do you choose a vendor? Uh, well, based on the requirements. Well, that's a nice thought. Usually it's, well, what vendor are you using today? That's the reality, right? So, yeah, we, we actually want the freedom of choice to pick a vendor, pick a piece of hardware for that use case. And that's really the only way we see to do it at scale is if we have that one common interface to all of them. Uh, have you adapted the new AX changes in the data model? Not yet. Not yet. Well, <laughs> PR is welcome. Anybody can, can do this. Uh, that's something we're going to work on this quarter. Um, on what wireless platforms Eric. can I do open config? Robert, let's do the PSK one. We didn't talk about that in the heat map, right? Where we. What would this mean for the like, PSK or something more complicated? Oh, yeah. Um, show that so me. we're lucky enough in that most of our deployments have the same uh, Mac, Mac layer config, like SSIDs and, and whatnot. But it's, you know, of course, it's not true. Like I said, we have a lot of different deployments. So we actually solved that problem by um, just adding a slide. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like the last slide on, again, what I'm referring to as the heat map. I don't know if this is going to come up. Probably won't. Yeah, we only have 30 seconds. Okay, so basically, we just have a, a slide, a, the last slide on our heat map, which uh, you can just put in strings, like, you know, SSID name, colon, and what you want it to be. Oh, um, oh we, got, we got it up. So, it's, you know, it's pretty rudimentary, but, and now it's like, it's blank. There's nothing uh, in there. Scroll but to the right. Oh, you didn't have a PSK on this one. Yeah, okay. exactly. So there's not much to see there. But, but yeah, we um, put it in this table goes into the JSON. We call them deviations just because it's a deviation from the sort of standard config, which usually applies like 80% of the time. But it's essentially you put a, an open config leaf, colon, the value, and then our automation tool just picks that up and swaps out um, the keys. I think we, with that, we are at time. So thank you very much. If there are questions, um, reach out to us. I got stickers over there on the, on the table, if anybody wants. Um, and yeah. Yeah, Albano M at Google. <laughs>